And you can also see lots and lots of, of, of starlight, which has obvious distinct color right across the entire sky. If you compare that to a Bortle scale nine, which is your inner city sky, you can see that the Milky Way is certainly not visible in that circumstance. And only the very basic sort of star clusters can be seen by the most experienced observers and the brightest constellations uh, are discernible, but may have missing stars. So there's a huge scale from one to nine on the Bortle scale. So have a little look at um, actually the Milky Way from planet Earth. So this is what we would expect to see in the darkest parts of Exmoor National Park on a dark, uh, clear night. This is essentially a Bortle scale one because you've got the reflection from the water and you've got a fair amount of detail in those dust lanes of the Milky Way. And just because I'm normally um, inspiring people to look up and, and understand what they're seeing in terms of the night sky, I thought we'd just spend a couple of slides looking at actually what the Milky Way is and what we're actually looking at. So the Milky Way is the galaxy that planet Earth sits in. It's, it's where the solar system operates and essentially, it's a galaxy in space, a galaxy containing a, more than 100 billion stars. I've put up on the screen a little simulation of the Milky Way. And as you can see, uh, as I say, it's a simulation because the Milky Way is such a vast galaxy that we haven't yet worked out how to get outside the galaxy and take a selfie looking back at ourselves. So this is what scientists believe the Milky Way looks like. We think it's a, a spiral galaxy. It may even be what we call a barred spiral, which means that the uh, inner part of the actual galaxy where the bright sort of egg yolk is of our galaxy may well be sort of more elongated than circular. But essentially it's, it's probably a barred spiral um, and as I say, containing at least 100 billion stars. Uh, and in this little circle here, which I've illustrated on the screen, is where you are. That is planet Earth, the entire solar system, and every single star that you can see at night. So you can see that we actually operate in a very small part of this massive galaxy. Just to give you an idea of scale of the Milky Way, if we were to go from here to here at the speed of light, which is 186,000 miles per second, it would take us at least 100,000 years to go across. So when you're standing in the middle of Exmoor National Park on a dark sky and you're looking up and you're viewing the Milky Way in all its glory, what you're actually looking at is you're looking towards the centre, towards the centre of the Milky Way. You're looking through this gas lane here uh, up on the screen. Um, and some of that gas, that gas and that dust gets in the way of the stars behind. So quite often when you look at the Milky Way, you'd see this sort of black stretch of dust, which seems to glow from behind. So essentially you're looking towards the center. And as I say, that's how we measure light pollution, uh, certainly from Exmoor and on the Bortle scale. But light pollution is not just a UK problem. Here we've got a map uh, taken from the very kind permission of the International Dark Sky Association. And you can see uh, quite clearly uh, where the problem of light pollution truly exists. Uh, you've got it all around the cities, the glow of orange around London, around Liverpool, Middlesbrough, going right up into Scotland. And then on contrast, you can see the actual areas where it's pretty dark. So if we look obviously here on Exmoor, that's where we are. Uh, we have obviously the Brecon Beacons in Mid Wales. We have Northumbria and up on the Yorkshire Dales. And then obviously up into the Highlands I, I and West, Western Isles of Scotland. I, I can't hear anyone. Oh, I'm... Okay, hopefully you can hear me. I'm not sure that Keith can, so um, I will carry on. But basically, the, 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 you know, there are very uh, great demarcation between places which have very dark skies and places.
places which clearly don't. And what saddens me the most, also of my teaching and inspiration, particularly in schools, you will visit some places, for, for example, in London, where children are not even able to see simple constellations because of the amount of light pollution. And as I say, it's not just a UK problem, it happens all over the world. So this is a picture of Paris from space and New York, and you can certainly see the sky glow above the skies there in New York. And there are even places in the world where you think that light pollution may not be quite as much of a problem, such as Iran. But yes, even though you can see the Milky Way here, you can see that sky glow encroaching on the darkness of the night. So it's a massive problem. And that's not all. So it's not just from arti artificial light. We are having increasing light, uh, light pollution threats from outer space too. So you may have heard of this gentleman, very famous in terms of space exploration, and very uh, driven in terms of space exploration. This chap is called Elon Musk. Uh, and he's sort of um, uh, the guy behind putting a uh, potentially humans on Mars. He's developing super rocket technology. And for that, I can't, you know, I can't demean him. However, uh, he has a hand in this, something called Starlink and the Starlink constellation. The star is essentially a series of star, uh, Starlink satellites, which are, are being placed in orbit around the Earth to provide 5G internet across the world. And whilst that might seem absolutely fantastic and obviously may solve the world's internet uh, problems, particularly in areas where internet is not so great, it does and will have a potential catastrophic e effect on being able to observe the night sky. So his, his plan is to put 42,000 satellites up into space above the Earth. And if we have a look at what this would look like, uh, from Earth, and this includes Exmoor National Park as well, uh, this is, is potentially what would be seen from the ground. So it's, it, this is what we call a Starlink constellation train. And essentially what these are, are satellites that are reflecting the sun's light. So they don't have any light of their own, but the, the means of propelling these objects uh, through uh, the um, shields um, actually reflects the sunlight. And if you imagine a sky full of 42,000 of these objects, that's what it will potentially look like from space, the whole uh, sort of web, if you like, of satellites across the world. So one thing I do want you to take from my little talk this morning about light pollution and astronomical skies is actually we need to make people aware of this. It's, um, you know, from the ground, it can be seen as, as quite a cool thing to look at, but actually we need to make people aware that this is and has the potential to be quite detrimental to observing the night sky and maybe lobby councils and so forth uh, against it. So what about Exmoor? Well, Exmoor um, has, has previously been said, was one of the first uh, dark sky or Europe's first dark sky reserves. But since uh, that time in 2011, uh, more mental effects of light pollution, particularly on human health, particularly on wildlife, but also particularly on observational ast astronomy. And so various different places across uh, the country have now set up and we're getting much more recognition in terms of why it's important to ge keep your dark skies uh, really, truly dark. So let's have a little closer look at Exmoor National Park. And obviously this map is probably familiar to all of you, but um, I've recently done um, a guide, which Katrina is going to tell you and uh, tell you about and talk to you about, um, about the best types of places on Exmoor to actually observe the night sky. But I want to just sort of show you actually how uh, Exmoor is actually split up and, and where sort of to go if, if you want to do some serious one to three bottle scale stargazing. So all the sort of purple areas here are pretty much bottle scale one to three. So some of these areas offer the best opportunities to see a truly dark starlit sky. But that's not to demean any of the other areas that are in, in grey. Um, 
nowhere on Exmoor National Park is above a, a bottle scale of four. Uh, four stroke five um, and so you know the whole park itself is is an absolute fantastic gem uh, in terms of astronomy uh, stargazing and observations of the night sky so um, you can normally see around about uh, a thousand stars at least with the naked eye on Exmoor National Park uh, and if we compare that to the nearest city to Exmoor which is is Taunton um, yeah, you're, you're lucky if you can see 50. So, you know, even within that sort of short distance, uh, we go from having truly dark to, you know, this is probably a Bortle scale eight stroke nine. Uh, and this is the place where we'd find children who are not able to see uh, star patterns and star constellations particularly clearly. So it's a real, real shame. And it is something that obviously Exmoor are working to maintain. And, and obviously we do work really hard in order to keep the skies above Exmoor truly truly dark. Uh, what a beautiful place. So this is a fantastic picture of the Milky Way taken from, uh, you probably recognise it, but it's uh, Dunkery Beacon. And as I said to you before, you're looking towards the centre of our own galaxy. Uh, here's that dust lane I was explaining about. So the darkness of that dust is literally clouding or shielding the glow of all of those 100 billion stars uh, behind it. So, you know, truly standing here, looking at that, it gives you a sort of sense of scale of the universe uh, that we live in. It's, it's immense. Um, in case you're interested in finding out more about the value of a dark sky and how it affects astronomical observations, but also research and science, uh, these are some fantastic websites that you can take a look at. Uh, I would certainly recommend this one, Commission for Dark Skies, uh, which goes on to talk about light pollution in detail and also sort of some of the mitigations that you can use for light pollution, because it's not necessarily about using no light. It's using the right type of lighting at the right time and for the right purpose. So there's some super tips on uh, the Commission for Dark Skies on how you can do that. Again, the International Dark Skies Association are instrumental across the world in trying to maintain dark skies for astronomical research, as is the Royal Astronomical Society and uh, the Campaign for Rural England, as they used to be called, are now the countryside charity. They also sort of um, petition and lobby uh, for keeping our skies uh, dark for all of the reasons that we've become to understand and obviously there's the link for the dark sky reserve to find out the best places to go and observe those amazing dark uh, sun, uh, starlit skies. So I'm going to leave you with a little video which um, actually explains basically what I've said but actually with visuals so visual images of the night sky across the world uh, it's a, a, a little video from a friend of mine called Mark G who is lucky enough to live uh, in New Zealand uh, where the skies are particularly dark but his message in this video um, is really key for everybody it's key for everyone across the world in actually maintaining the darkness so that we can preserve the night sky for the future generations to come so enjoy The sun goes down every single day in cities around the world, and as day turns to night, we illuminate our cities with artificial light. Unfortunately, much of this artificial lighting is a form of pollution. This light pollution threatens our environments, energy resources, humans and wildlife, as well as astronomical research. And with cities consistently expanding, this form of pollution is progressively affecting our lives and spreading further each year. So why do I care? Well, apart from all the negative effects, the further you move away from the cities, the less light pollution there is. And the night sky, free of light pollution, with all its incredible detail. Well, that's just something you really need to experience for yourself.
Life without dark skies? You don't know what you're missing. And thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed that. And I hope you've, I've inspired you to go out and look at that beautiful dark uh, night sky. Thank you.